Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have uh, the first talk of the spring term, the first start colloquium talk of the spring term, and so a pleasure to have it by done by, by Dean's uh, distinguished visiting professor Sanjeev Khanna, who is a professor at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Khanna received his undergraduate degree from Berlin Institute of Technology and a uh, master's degree from uh, University uh, of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and PhD degree from Stanford University. Professor Kana is a Guggenheim Fellow and Sloan Fellow, and an editor of uh, several prestigious journals in uh, theoretical computer science. So today we have the pleasure to learn about matching. So, Thanks, Kostya. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a faster combinatorial algorithm for a bipartite matching problem. And this is joint work with uh, Julia Shuzai at uh, TTIC. OK, so let me uh, just remind everyone quickly uh, the definition of the bipartite matching problem. You are given a bipartite graph G. Um, and the goal is to find a matching of uh, largest possible size in this graph. So in this try example, the red edges form a possible solution to this problem. Okay? And throughout the talk, I'm going to follow the convention that the number of vertices in the graph is going to be denoted by n, and the number of edges by m. Okay? This will be consistent throughout the talk. So as you can imagine, um, this problem has a really long and rich history. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a few uh, relevant results here. So the textbook algorithms for bipartite matching are based on uh, the observation that the problem can be reduced to a directed max flow computation. Okay? So just using this connection, you can get an order m and time algorithm for this problem. And the idea is, as long as you do not have a maximum matching, if you look at the residual flow network defined by your current matching solution, you can find an augmenting path in this residual flow network in order m time. Okay? So after order, order m time of computation, you increase the matching size by 1. And since there can be at most n augmentations, this gives you an order m n time algorithm. This basic idea. Um, was um, speeded up by an, using an elegant observation by Hopcroft and Karp. And they said the following. In each iteration, instead of finding a single augmenting path, let's find a maximal collection of augmenting paths, disjoint augmenting paths, of shortest possible length. Okay? And if you do that, they showed that the shortest augmenting path length would go up by at least two. And this means you can cut down the total number of phases from n down to root n. Okay? So this immediately will uh, give you then order m times square root n time algorithm. And around the same time, a different al approach, an algebraic approach, um, was developed, which is based on uh, fast matrix multiplication. And, uh, and this gives uh, another uh, way to solve the bipartite matching problem, uh, whose complexity is tied to the complexity of matrix multiplication. So omega here is the matrix multiplication exponent. And current value of omega is 2.37. 2 so this gives you an n to the 2.37 time algorithm for bipartite matching. OK, so for the next 40 years or so, these algorithms define the state of the art for bipartite matching problem. Okay? If the graph is very dense, as close to omega and square edges, then the matrix multiplication approach would give you the fastest algorithm. Otherwise, hopcroft karp algorithm is the algorithm to beat. Okay? And in fact, there was a, um, it gave rise to, you know, there was this tantalizing uh, open problem is it possible that bipartite matching can, in fact, be solved in linear time? So maybe there is an order n plus m time algorithm for this problem. Okay. There was no lower bound to rule out that possibility. 
So starting in around, um, roughly around 2008 or so, Deitch and Spielman um, introduced a new framework for solving flow problems using continuous techniques. And uh, as the first major uh, breakthrough based on this uh, framework, Madri in 2013 gave a m to the 10 over 7 time algorithm for directed max flow. Okay. So if you can solve directed max flow in m to the 10 over 7 time, then you can also solve bipartite matching in the same time. So this became the first algorithm after 40 years to outperform hopper carp algorithm, at least in the case of sparse graphs. More spectacular developments followed um, soon afterwards. In 2020, Vandenbrand et al. gave a M plus N to the 1.5 time algorithm for bipartite matching, thereby showing that at least when the graph is moderately dense, you can solve the bipartite matching problem in linear time. Okay? So if M is more than N to the 1.5 time, you're solving it now in linear time. And then in 2022, Chen et al. got the ultimate result. Um, they gave an almost linear time algorithm for solving directed max flow and hence bipartite matching. Okay? So this more or less settles that tantalizing question whether or not bipartite, bipartite matching is solvable in um, uh, linear time. Now, all these amazing developments are based on continuous techniques. That was the paradigm shift. And, uh, and this history of developments for um, bipartite matching raises a very natural question. Are continuous techniques essential to outperform the state of the art defined by combinatorial algorithms, which is really the hopcroft carp algorithm? Okay? So was, there, was this the only path forward? to do better than the runtime obtained by hopcroft carp algorithm. And this question is interesting for two simple reasons. Um, one, combinatorial algorithms tend to be conceptually simple, and uh, their actions are easy to interpret. And we think, generally, combinatorial algorithms help us understand something structural about the problem. In the in the context of bipartite matching, the combinatorial algorithms are based on a very natural idea of augmenting the matching using augmenting paths. The second reason um, is speeding up combinatorial algorithms for bipartite matching may pave the way for getting faster algorithms for other problems which have not benefited yet from continuous techniques. Okay? And the most um, interesting example of such a problem, um, which we can feel somewhat hopeful about, is the general matching problem, where the fastest known algorithm is essentially now 50 years old. Okay, okay so what are um, our results? Well, our main result is that it is indeed possible um, to get faster combinatorial algorithms for bipartite matching. And in particular, um, we design a deterministic combinatorial algorithm for this problem that runs in time, which is m to the one-third times n to the five-thirds. Okay. So let's interpret this runtime. If the graph has more than n to the seven-fourth edges, if m is more than n to the seven-fourth, then this algorithm outperforms hopcroft karp algorithm. Okay. So if the graph is sufficiently dense, we, are now, uh, we now have a faster combinatorial algorithm than hopcraft car. And this algorithm outperforms the matrix multiplication approach at all edge densities, okay. uh, because its worst case runtime is n to the 7 over 3, which is better than n to the 2.37. And then there is a standard reduction um, from vertex capacitated flows to bipartite matching problem. So which just allows us to uh, get as a corollary of this result, also a combinatorial algorithm for directed max flow with uniform vertex capacities. Okay, okay so, uh, and uh, 
Towards the end of my talk, um, uh, if there is time, I will also tell you a little bit about some further developments uh, on, these, uh, on these results. OK, so the rest of this talk um, is going to focus on giving you a flavor of the ideas that are uh, behind uh, uh, our main result, which is this faster algorithm for bipartite matching problem. And, uh, and I've organized it into three parts. So the first part, um, I will show you how bipartite matching problem can be reduced to a dynamic graph problem known as decremental single source shortest path problem. And informally in this problem, you are given a graph which is undergoing edge deletions, and you would want to maintain a single source shortest path tree or single source shortest path distances and paths in this graph as it undergoes edge deletions. Okay? And what you want to achieve here is not to have to recompute after each edge deletion. Okay? This reduction will happen through um, via the multiplicative weights update framework. And then in the second part, I will um, highlight that uh, the particular decremental single source shortest path problem that we need to solve for bipartite matching application has some several nice pro properties. And we crucially exploit these special properties, these structural properties of our decremental problem to get a faster algorithm for this particular version of decremental problem. So I'll call this version restricted uh, decremental problem. And then I will also show you how the uh, result for this decremental problem, the restricted decremental problem, gives us our main result, which is an m to the one third times n to the five third time algorithm for bipartite matching. And the last part, I will give you an overview of the ideas that give us this faster algorithm for the restricted decremental problem. Okay, so it's, it's I've tried to make it fairly modular, and uh, so hopefully even if uh, you know, one of the parts is not very clear, you can join in the next part. Okay, so let's start with the first part. And, um, and the starting point here is um, the textbook connection between bipartite matching and the max flow problem. So suppose you have a current matching M in your input graph G. Then the task of augmenting M to a maximum matching is equivalent to finding a maximum flow in the residual flow network defined by this matching, okay? How does the residual flow network look? Um, we will exploit the special structure of this uh, residual flow network, so how does it look? It's basically a directed bipartite graph where all edges go from left to right, except the edges in the matching which are directed backwards, okay? and all edge capacities are one. Okay. So in this network, you can see every vertex will have either in degree one or out degree one. Okay. So that's the special property of this network. Okay, so the task of computing now max flow in the residual flow network, I can cast that problem as a linear program uh, as follows. So, um, so let's gamma star be set of all possible ST paths in my residual flow network H. I'm going to define a flow variable F of P for every path P. And the goal now is to maximize the sum of the flows on these uh, uh, paths, subject to the constraint that for any edge, the total flow that is passing through that edge is bounded by one, okay? So it's a natural the dual of this LP is a length assignment problem, where the goal now is to assign lengths to the edges so as to ensure that every ST path has a length which is at least one. Okay? So effectively, it's the problem that is separating us from T. Given this primal dual pair, there is a very simple multiplicative weight update algorithm for computing a solution to the primal problem, which is what we are interested in, the flow problem. So here is what we will do. 
On the primal side, I'm going to initialize a set gamma to empty set. This will be my flow solution eventually. And on the dual side, I'm going to uh, initialize length of every edge to 1 over m. Okay? And the algorithm is just now the following. While there exists an ST path P in H whose length is at most 1, I'm going to add P to my solution gamma. So the way you should interpret this action is that I'm sending a flow of one unit along this path P. And I'm going to double the length of every edge along this path P. Okay. And this is marking the fact that this edge is getting utilized. OK, how do we analyze this algorithm? Well, uh, there are two things we need to analyze. First, what's the congestion? this approach causes on the edges. This one is simple. On any edge, at most, log m paths uh, could end up using this edge for any edge. Because every time I use an edge, I double its edge length. By the time it reaches 1, it can never participate in discovery on, of an ST path of length at most 1. What about the solution value? Well, every iteration ex increases the ST flow value by 1. But on the dual side, the cost of the dual solution increases by at most one, because I doubled the edge length on a path whose total length was at most one. So we end up recovering a primal solution whose value is as large, at least as large, as a feasible dual solution. So that means we are recovering essentially an optimal solution, except the catch is we have violated edge capacities along the way, but not by too much, only by an order log m term. OK. So suppose we had a flow solution like this, which is recovering the optimal ST flow in the residual flow network with a congestion of order log m. I want to show you now, if you had this flow solution in your hand, you can easily recover from it a way to augment your current matching by a large amount. Okay? So how would we do this? So let's define delta to be the shortfall uh, that the current matching uh, M has. So this is the gap between the optimum solution size and the current matching size. Okay? And this will be, uh, delta is a quantity defined like this throughout this talk. Okay? So I run this. Uh, multiplicative weight update algorithm to get a flow of value omega delta, but with congestion order log m. Okay? So first thing to observe is since every ST path in the residual flow network H is an alternating path, it alternates between matching and non-matching edges, the support of this flow F that I've recovered is only order n log n edges. Because there can be at most n matching edges, and each one of them can be used log n times, and all the other ed edges can be paired to a matching edge, okay? Because it's an alternating path. Good. Now I, I'm going to scale down my flow f by an order log n factor, and this will give me a no congestion fractional ST flow f prime whose value is omega delta over log n, okay? But in this network, all capacities are integers. Okay? So I have a fractional valid flow of this value, and the network is uh, integer capacitated. Now we can round this flow f prime to an integral ST flow of the same value in n to the 3 half deterministic time. Okay? And how do we do this rounding? We basically run the blocking flow idea of hopkerf karp algorithm. It's as if I am basically solving the bipartite matching problem on a graph with n log n edges. Okay? That's what we have achieved here. Okay? okay, good. So this means we can augment m by omega delta over log n edges in n to the 3 half time using this approach. So what is missing? Well, we need an efficient oracle to solve the shortest path problem. 
So we need an oracle to repeatedly help us find st paths of length at most one in H as it is undergoing length changes, right? I, what is the algorithm? As long as there is an st path of length at most one, I find such a path. I push a flow of one unit on this path, but then I double the edge length. And then I go back to searching for such a path again. Okay. So we need an oracle to implement. I have not so far accounted for time needed to do this step. So Madhuri in 2010 already observed that the task of efficiently implementing multiplicative weight update algorithms for graph problems can often be reduced to solving some sort of a dynamic graph problem, okay? In our case, the dynamic graph problem that we would need to solve turns out to be the decremental single source shortest path problem, okay? So let me explain how we can convert our task to a decremental single source shortest path problem. So H is our residual flow network where, which is going to undergo length changes. We're going to create a new graph H prime from H, where for each edge E in H, I'm going to make log M parallel copies. What do these copies represent? They are going to have different length assignments to them. So there will be one copy with weight one over M, another copy with weight two over M, ith copy will have weight two to the i divided by m, all the way up to one, okay? They represent each doubling of edge length. Okay. And now how do I up implement doubling of length operation? Whenever in this graph h prime, you will give me an st path, I will end up deleting the cheapest weight copy of every edge on this path. And that's it. Now the only, the next available option is twice the length. Okay, so let's may summarize then what's the task at hand. We have a weighted directed graph which is undergoing edge deletions. And we are given a source vertex S. And our goal is to maintain a data structure which can repeatedly help us answer uh, approximate single source shortest path queries, okay? Approximate is good enough, okay? Constant factor approximation is all we need. Okay. An important point to emphasize here, the deletions that the graph is undergoing, they are being done by an adaptive adversary, okay? In fact, whatever path the algorithm outputs is exactly those set of edges which get deleted. So the deletions are completely correlated to the behavior of the algorithm, okay? This is a key source of difficulty uh, here that we have to deal with an adaptive adversary, okay? But there has been fortunately a lot of recent work um, on decremental single source shortest path. And, and we are going to, in fact, build uh, on these recent developments here. So what do we know about this problem um, so far? If the input graph is a DAG, um, which is a directed acyclic graph, then there is a deterministic one plus epsilon approximate uh, shortest path decremental algorithm, which takes total time roughly order n square, okay? So whenever you have a deterministic algorithm, you are happy there is no adaptive or adversary worried, okay? That's the worry only with the randomized algorithm. In the same paper, Bernstein et al. also give an algorithm for general directed graphs with the same runtime, but it only works for oblivious adversaries, not for adaptive adversaries, okay? Then uh, in a parallel work, um, they managed to extend the deterministic algorithm for DAGs all the way to general directed graphs. But the total time taken now is n to the eight over three. Okay. So we have taken a big hit from n square to n to the eight third. Okay. Unfortunately, if we rely on this, we can never hope to beat 
Hopkraft Karp algorithm. Okay? Because even in a graph with n square edges, Hopkraft Karp algorithm runs in n to the 2.5 time. This is already more than that. Okay? So in no regime, we could use this algorithm and beat Hopkraft Karp algorithm. Fortunately, our setting has several useful features, which is exactly what we will do is to use, exploit those features to speed up this algorithm for our application. Okay. So what are those features? Well, I'll highlight two key features. Our decremental single source shortest path instances, they are not arbitrary directed graphs. They are graphs that correspond to residual flow network of bipartite matching problem. In particular, these are directed graphs where all the edges are directed from left to right with the exception of a single matching that's directed from right to left, okay? So I'm going to call these instances well-structured instances, instances which look exactly like this, okay? And everything we will do, they will be targeted towards well-structured instances. We are not solving the general decremental problem. Second, we need to answer these shortest STPath queries efficiently only as long as there are many edge disjoint STPaths. If there are not too many augmentations left, I can switch to another strategy. I could even switch to the strategy of augmenting, matching one edge at a time and pay order M for every augmentation. I only need efficiency when there are a lot of augmenting paths out there and I don't want to pay for them one augmentation at a time. We are going to exploit this feature too. Okay, so that brings me to part two where I'll just formalize the restricted decremental single so short as path problem that we need to solve. I will then tell you what is our result for this restricted decremental problem and how it gives us the main result, which is the algorithm for bipartite matching, okay? Okay, so here is the restricted single source shortest path problem that we need to solve. So once again, delta is the shortfall between the optimum matching size and your current matching M. Input to the restricted problem is a well-structured graph and a parameter delta, um, and each edge, uh, in this graph has an integer length between one and L. I've moved from one over M, one, two over M to one just by scaling. That's all that's happening here, okay? Now what's the goal? I need to support the following operation for delta iterations. Find an ST path P of length order L. L is the proxy for one from the uh, previous framework. Delete edges on this path P from G, okay? And repeat, because I want to do delta augmentation, so I want to support this operation for delta iteration. Except we'll give our restricted problem one more serving of a helping hand. The algorithm is allowed to exit early. If the number of edge disjoint ST paths of length order L has fallen below delta over log square N, which means initially I started with the goal of delta augmentations. I have recovered a good fraction of these augmentations already. What remains is now below delta over log square N. The algorithm can say, quit. I cannot continue finding efficiently a short ST path. So the algorithm only needs to continue finding a short ST path when there is an abundance of edge disjoint ST paths of the desired length, okay? That's a very powerful feature. So here is our result for this restricted single source shortest path problem. There is a deterministic combinatorial algorithm for this restricted single source shortest path problem that runs in time n to the 2.5 by square root delta. Okay. 
This is looking better than n to the eight third time. That's maybe the main takeaway from just this statement, okay? And in particular, um, it's looking um, uh, definitely promising when delta is large to rely on this runtime. Okay, so if I plug this as the oracle in the multiplicative weight update framework that I showed in the first part, then I get the following corollary by using the rounding scheme I showed you, that when delta is your shortfall, uh, shortfall you can augment your matching M by delta over polylog N edges in time, which is N to the 2.5 by square root delta, okay? The, which is what we did by rounding. We recovered one over polylog N fraction of the flow that the multiplicative weight update algorithm collected and used it to augment the current matching. So let's see how this gives us the main result. So let's fix some threshold delta star, and we will see what delta star needs to be for us to get our result. And let's initialize m to be empty set. Uh, and delta will, at all times, will denote the shortfall between optimum matching size and the current matching size, okay? While this shortfall delta is at least as large as delta star, I'm going to run this matching augmentation algorithm that I just highlighted using the restri restricted SSP algorithm. And it will help me augment my matching by delta over polylog and edges in n to the 2.5 by square root delta star time, okay? Because I'm only running this when delta is greater than delta star, so the denominator which was square root delta in the runtime, will never go below delta star, okay? Now, each time I run it, I'm ending up augmenting my matching by, uh, by uh, one over polylog and delta over polylog n edges. So it means the residual delta falls by one minus one over polylog n factor, okay? So this process can't continue for more than polylog n iterations before delta falls below delta star, okay? So I'm going to just run this matching augmentation algorithm for polylog and iterations, and that's enough to ensure that my gap between optimum matching size and my current matching falls below delta star. The total time I would have spent in this part is just going to be n to the 2.5 by root delta star. I'm hiding polylog factors, okay? For the remaining delta star shortfall, I don't want to run the, that algorithm again because that algorithm has root delta in the denominator. When delta is small, it's delta constant, it would be terrible algorithm to run. So for the remaining last delta star shortfall, I'm just going to augment one edge at a time by using the standard order m time algorithm, okay? And the total time spent in this part will be m times delta star, okay? Okay, so you just want to balance the time spent on both parts, and that choice comes out to be n to the 5 thirds divided by m to the 2 thirds, and if you plug in, add up both times, it will be m to the 1 third times n to the 5 third, which is the result that we wanted to prove. Okay, so once you have that restricted SSP algorithm, rest follows easily, okay? Okay, so this brings me to part three, which is the um, restricted SSP algorithm. And I'll try to give you a flavor of the ideas that, um, uh, that play a role in getting this result. Okay, so this is the result we want to get. We want to get an algorithm that supports uh, decremental single source shortest path and with the special property instances which have uh, special properties like the ones I described in n to the 2.5 by root delta time. So we're going to follow the framework of uh, BGS20, which is the paper that got n to the 8 third time result. Okay. Um, 
which is the one that we want to speed up. And at a high level, this framework reduces the problem in general directed graphs to solving the problem in DAG-like graphs, okay? Graphs which are not quite DAG, but they are not too far from being a DAG. Okay? And for DAGs, I pointed out to you, there is a fast algorithm, okay? So this algorithm is really based on a reduction from general problem to DAG-like graph. Uh, and this, this reduction, which allows them to get an end to the third time algorithm. Okay? We will use then special features of our setting to take this end to the third time all the way down to end to the 2.5 over square root delta. Okay? So that's the plan. OK, so let me start by telling you about um, a classical result for decremental single source shortest path, um, which is um, often plays a role as a building block in many of these uh, algorithms and results. Okay? So what is this uh, algorithm? Uh, it says the following. So th this data structure is called the even Shalock trees. And it says the following. Suppose you're given a directed graph with the integer edge length and you're given a target distance parameter d. And this graph is undergoing edge deletions, and at all times you want to maintain a single source shortest path tree from s up to distance d. Okay? You don't have to worry about vertices whose distance is past d. Then you can deterministically maintain these distances exactly in order m times d total. Okay, so if you're recomputing every time, every deletion, you will be spending order m time for every single update, and that would be order m square time. And this is saying that, no, you don't have to do, uh, pay for it by a, a, a recomputation. You can do it uh, much better, and the total time you pay is m times t. And the key idea in this algorithm is to maintain the following invariant. Whenever, so you have a current shortest path tree. Suppose I delete an edge UV on this single source shortest path tree. I have to repair this tree. I have to put reconnect V to the right place in the shortest path tree. And that involves examining incoming edges into V and figuring out which is the best option to reconnect V back into the tree. The way the algorithm proceeds in doing this examination of incoming edges into V, it ends up implementing, maintaining an invariant essentially, which comes down to the following statement. Every time the algorithm has to scan incoming edges into V, it can couple it to establishing the distance from, of, uh, from S to V went up by at least one. Okay. If you can maintain this invariant, then you know that every vertex can have its distance go up at most d times, because all edge lengths are one, uh, are integers. And every vertex in degree can be examined, therefore, at most d times. So the total work done by the algorithm will become m times t. Okay? That's the idea of this data structure. Okay? Bernstein et al. observed that we can considerably speed up the idea uh, underlying Evan Shalock trees in the setting of DAGs, okay? provided we give up on the goal of exact distances and settle for one plus epsilon approximate solution. Okay? So I want to explain to you uh, informally at least, what's the idea behind uh, this speed up, okay? Because that's relevant to um, uh, explaining what we end up doing. So since G is a DAG, you can topologically sort the vertices. And let me denote by tau of U the position of vertex U in the topologically sorted order, okay? And now for any edge UV, let me define the span of this edge to be the jump in the topological order that this edge represents, okay? So it's simply the difference between tau u and tau v, okay? 
And here is a simple observation. Let's look at any ST path in, in this tag. If I sum up span of all the edges on this path, this span can be no more than n. Because every edge is taking you forward, and span e, if you use an edge of span e, you went span e steps forward. There are no backward edges. All edges are directed from left to right. So the total span of the edges on any ST path is bounded by n. So what does that mean? That means no ST path can use too many edges with long span. Okay? If you had a very dense graph, most edges in the graph are long span. There can't be too many edges of short span. Okay? And this is saying no ST path uses too many edges with long span. And this means you can be lazy in processing edges with long span. So for example, if I had an edge whose span was omega n, I know there will be only constant number of such edges on my path. I can examine them only after my distance has increased by at least one plus epsilon factor, and that would be good enough. Okay. So there is a more precise rule, which I have stated here. You process edges of span L after every epsilon d times L over n uh, increase, distance increases. And the point of this equation is if you multiply this, uh, uh, this uh, if you sum up the errors due to this lazy examination for any path, L will sum up over the edges of the path to be order n. The error, therefore, will be just epsilon d. Okay? This is the idea that gives order n square over epsilon time algorithm. Why can't we do the same in general graphs? Well, we have backward edges. And now any ST path can have span as large as order n square. One edge, you take an edge to go forward, maybe n steps almost, omega n. Then another edge on the path takes you backward, and you go back and forth, and your span can be n square. And the whole efficiency in the DAG algorithm comes from the fact that the span is bounded by order n. If I now work with this span value, that order n square time would become order n cube, and we will not get anything good. Okay. Okay. So here is a natural idea. Let's just find strongly connected components in my general directed graph. Okay? This will turn the graph into a DAG. Okay. Contract these components and just work with that. Sounds great. There will be no backward edges, and we'll be in the DAG setting. Problem is that an ST path, when it enters one of these contracted vertices, it enters this strongly connected component at some vertex x, exits at some other vertex y. I now also have to find a path to go from x to y inside this strongly connected component. Okay. So we need a mechanism to find a short path between any pair of vertices inside a strongly connected component. But that's not easy to do in an arbitrary strongly connected graph, so we need some special properties. So this is where Bernstein, Gutenberg, and Saranurak came up with a, a nice framework. So instead of partitioning vertices into strongly connected components, they partition vertices into a collection of expander-like graphs, where you can find short paths between any pair of vertices inside each expander-like piece. And this, then, is combined with an approximate topological order assignment to these expander-like pieces. So you also order these expander-like pieces as if they were collectively forming a DAG. Okay. We won't be able to ensure that they are a perfect DAG structure. But what they do ensure is there will not be too many edges going backwards after they perform this decomposition. Okay. This, therefore, allows them to reduce this to what they called decremental single source shortest path problem on a DAG-like graph. Okay? It's not quite DAG, so strongly connected components have been replaced by expander-like graphs, and I'll have backward edges, but they will try to control 
the total span of the backward edges okay, in this decomposition. So this is how the picture would look. So you will have edges going both forward and backward. And we have these clusters, uh, these blobs, and these are expander-like graphs, which makes it easy to find short paths between any pair of vertices there. But as the edges will get deleted, some of these clusters may, longer, may no longer be expanders. So you have to split them into smaller clusters. Okay? You are splitting them to create smaller expanders. And at that point, you would need to rearrange, reorder these clusters so you do not generate too many backward edges. Okay? And you do that by making sure only the sparse cut, so when you partition a cluster, it's because you found a sparse cut, only the edges in the sparse cut are the backward edges. Okay? That's what you'll do. Okay, so here is a theorem that captures the essence of what you, know, you can achieve using this framework. For any gamma, there is a deterministic n squared plus gamma n time algorithm for maintaining order one approximate shortest path for decremental SSP problem, provided the total span of backward edges on any shortest path is bounded by gamma. So remember in the beginning I pointed out naively the span can be as large as n square, then this will be an order n cube time result. Okay? But if you had any mechanism to reduce gamma a little bit on short ST paths, then you will start to beat the n cube bound. And this is exactly what the BGS algorithm does, and they manage to reduce this gamma n term all the way to n to the eight third, and this is how they get their n to the eight third algorithm. Okay? So we are going from n cube to n to the eight third by reducing this gamma. Okay. Okay. What about our setting? There is one more observation about our problem that I'm going to exploit, which I highlighted in the original formulation. We only need to return an ST path as long as there are lots of them and they are edge disjoint. So as long as there are at least delta over log square n edge disjoint ST path, our algorithm needs to efficiently return one. Otherwise, it can say I quit. This means if I look at that n square plus gamma n bound, that gamma span is now split over these delta over log square n edge reshwine path. So there must be one path whose backward span is not too large. So effectively, that bound of n square plus gamma n for us becomes n square plus gamma n divided by delta. And that allows us to basically work through the BGS algorithm by choosing different parameters, optimizing things differently to get n to the 2.5 by square root delta. Okay? So that's the key idea. The fact that they have to answer these queries for every possible path, uh, uh, for every possible S comma V pair, even if there was only one path left. They had to support that. We have to only support it when there are tons of paths left. Okay, okay so let me summarize. Um, so we use the multiplicative weight update framework to reduce bipartite matching problem to a restricted version of the decremental single source shortest path problem with special properties. And, um, and then we use these special properties to get a faster combinatorial algorithm for bipartite matching, um, which you know, on sufficiently dense graphs beats hopcroft karp algorithm. And of course, there is still a large performance gap between what the continuous techniques can achieve. Um, they can g give you almost linear time algorithm for bipartite matching and what we are able to get here. Uh, so the question is, can this gap be narrowed further? Um, we made a bit more progress um, in this direction uh, very recently. So we have uh, uh, a new algorithm, which is uh, a combinatorial algorithm, which runs in time roughly 
n square. It's uh, slightly more than n square, but um, it's almost a quadratic time algorithm for bipartite matching. So at least on dense graphs, we are now able to match what uh, continuous techniques, more or less match, what continuous techniques are um, able to achieve. Now this algorithm is based on the same framework that I developed in this talk. It follows the same approach, okay? Except um, you can think of the algorithm that I presented here as a one-shot algorithm, and this result is based on a recursive version of this one-shot algorithm, okay? So do I have some, a few more minutes, or is it, I do, okay. So I can try to give uh, just a, a short, very short summary of uh, what's going on in, uh, in this new result. So uh, this new result is based on following, uh, based on um, uh, focusing on the following abstract problem, um, which I'll call route and cut. And this is a problem um, which we are trying to solve on well-structured graphs, okay? Not for general graphs, but for the residual flow networks that arrive in the bipartite matching. So what is the problem? You have two disjoint sets of vertices A and B, and you have two parameters, delta and eta. And your goal is to find either output, lot of uh, paths that connect vertices in A to vertices in B without causing too much congestion. Congestion is restricted to be at most eta. Or find a small cut showing this is not possible to do. Okay? Does this uh, look familiar problem? You can think of A as the unmatched vertices on the left side, B as the unmatched vertices on the right side, and essentially, the algorithm that I just presented can be viewed, even though I didn't use this language and this framework, can be viewed as solving this route and cut problem when eta is polylog n, okay? We were happy to allow polylog n congestion in solving the problem, okay? Now, our algorithm for solving this route and cut problem, which was to match the left unmatched vertices to the right unmatched vertices, reduce this task to solving a restricted single source shortest path problem. The implementation of that restricted single source shortest path algorithms required maintaining expander-like graphs. Right? That step, in turn, is also solving a route and cut problem. Okay? You're trying to embed an expander in your graph, and that's done by finding uh, by being able to find paths that connect vertices in two sets A and B. Except the version of the problem that we have to solve in that step, you can think of it as a simpler version than the top version that we are solving in the bipartite matching problem. It has to work on a shorter distance scale. So the summary of what we have done is really if you had an efficient algorithm for the restricted SSP problem, I showed you, you get an efficient algorithm for the route and cut problem, which was for us the bipartite matching problem. But the converse is also true. If I had an efficient algorithm for route and cut problem, I can use it as a building block in the restricted SSP algorithm when I have to maintain these expander-like graphs. So we build on this idea. In the current algorithm, uh, the, when we do expander-like graphs in the restricted SSP, we use a rather inefficient algorithm. But instead now, we are going to use recursion to replace it slowly by better and better algorithms, okay? So we're going to exploit this dependence between the two problems by creating parameterized versions of these problems. And let's say R is the parameter that controls the complexity of the problem that I'm solving. So we show that if you had an efficient algorithm for the R-restricted single source shortest path problem, it allows you to solve the route and cut problem for R plus one level of complexity, which is one higher level of complexity. And then I can plug that in 
to get a better algorithm for restricted SSP at one higher level of complexity. And we can continue this cycle to get better and better algorithms. Okay? And this is what leads to ultimately uh, n square time algorithm. Okay? There are lots of details and moving pieces here. I'm just trying to convey like the intuition behind um, how the, the, what's the approach. Okay. So let me wrap up. Um, so many interesting questions remain, and of course, you know, um, we ultimately would like to have a near linear time combinatorial algorithm for bipartite matching for all edge densities, uh, not just uh, for very dense graphs. And, um, um, and a really exciting um, and looks like a very difficult question here is, can these ideas um, be used to somehow um, get some progress on the general matching problem where uh, we remain stuck at uh, m root n time for 50 or so years. Okay. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, let us now have question and answer part. Uh, if you have question, please wait until I get to you with the mic so that we get get it on the recording. Maybe I will start. I have like, sorry, I'm, okay. I have a bit like question, uh, more philosophical. What is the combinatorial algorithm? What, what would be the partition that you are considering? Uh, what would be the boundary and to which we consider a bit not, not yeah. combinatorial? The, the <laughs> that's, uh, that's a great question and, uh, and the hardest question, I guess, <laughs> you, you can ask. Uh, there is no formal definition of, uh, um, you know, what constitutes a combinatorial algorithm, and sometimes, you know, for specific problems, people try to define them by um, focusing on what are the natural operations that make sense uh, in the context of uh, uh, this problem. So, for example, if you were thinking about, um, you know, Boolean matrix multiplication, fast algorithms which are based on cancellations, right, and we may consider they are not natural combinatorial algorithms for solving this problem. So in the context of, uh, you know, bipartite matching, a narrow definition might be, you know, algorithms which are based on augmentations, augmenting paths, and, uh, but there is no precise definition, and, um, and this is, uh, yeah, hard to really formalize. Because uh, here you went from multiplicative weight update, it looks like you introduced extra edges that help you mimic the behavior of uh, multiplication by two. Uh, it's not possible for the algorithms that are continuous to do the same kind of... Uh, Sorry, uh, can you repeat the question again? It, it looked like you introduced extra edges that helped you manipulate, I mean, like, that helped you mimic the change of the... Uh, weights that you assign to those edges. Yeah. So they're just parallel copies of the same ed yeah. edges. So everything is defined on the, um, every single path we find is an augmentation with respect to the original matching. Are there a similar things that one could do to those continuous? Uh, I mean, uh, ultimately, I'm sure there is some way to finally map, because after you compute the solution, you can say, uh, here, I define my ST flow, but usually the uh, continuous techniques, um, you know, they are based on reducing these directed flow problems to some, um, they, they use these interior point methods and they, each iteration is mapping it to some undirected problem and like electrical flow computation and so on, which is very hard to relate directly to, interpret directly to what it means, um, you know, each iteration what does it contribute to the improvement of your bipartite matching uh, solution? Whereas here you can see what each iteration means. And, uh, but it is subjective. I, you know, there is no mathematical definition that I know of. And um, yeah. Uh, any, okay. We got people. So 
you can hear me now. This is on. Good. So, um, like, if you look back to classical algorithm like top graph curve, in terms of runtime, they are inferior to like this algorithm or recent one. But in terms of depth of like parallelism, they are around root 10 iteration, for instance. And then when you move to something like this fast max flow algorithms, they increase the number of iterations to become like m to the one plus a small of one. Each iteration is mm -hmm. being done very efficiently. Right. This dynamic graph solution seems to be doing that. They are, they are paying a lot in the number of iterations in some sense, but implementing each iteration faster. Do you think any of these ideas give you something in the opposite direction, you can reduce the number of iterations of upcraft carp and don't know get n to the one over four depth in a parallel. So, so, so maybe even increasing the total time. Even increasing the total, total time. time past. Uh, I mean, in uh, the limit, if you can do it in log n, then you're proving uh, like bipartite matching is in NC, then that's yeah, perfect. Yeah, but yeah. even n to the one yeah. four or something. No, that's a good question, and uh, it's not clear a priori that um, how many paths could you peel off you know, in this uh, decremental SSP data structure, even optimistically or aggressively, you know, before um, being forced to do serious uh, updates, which is what it would amount to, that you know, in parallel you start to peel off, find lots of paths without worrying about uh, the length increases. Right. Or the congestion they create with each other. Yeah, so, so it, will, it will show up in the congestion. And, uh, but there might be um, certainly some trade-off here, right? Because you don't need to really make progress necessarily by one over poly log n. Um, so you could allow bigger congestion, um, and uh, that will allow for more parallelism. But whether it will give something interesting, I don't know. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I do? OK. Uh, you might have mentioned it. Uh, the definition of delta you use is optimum value minus the size of the matching. So is it the case that we know the value and we are trying to find the matching? Okay. Or excellent, excellent. Yeah, no, you don't know. Um, uh, uh, so you just do a binary search. Oh, oh over. So you just do binary search on opt, right? Right. So it gives us a log. Yes. So so basically, whenever you, your um, bound on opt is less than equal to the true optimum, the algorithm will succeed, mm -hmm. and otherwise you will fail and you will lower mm -hmm. your bound on the optimum. Okay. Thank you. No, very good. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. Are there any further questions? This one may also be philosophical, so I'm sorry. You mentioned one of the motivations was to get uh, like a better understanding of the structure of the problem. From the things that you have showed, what do you think they are? Like, from my perspective here, it seemed it was like this expander-like decomposition. Do you think that's where it's at? And could you talk a little bit about what do you mean by expander-like? Oh, sorry. Uh, what I mean by expander-like decomposition? Yeah, and uh, if you think that is like the core thing going on. Yeah, so, uh, so, so, so first the idea of the expander like decomposition is already there in the previous work, which gives the n to the eight third uh, time algorithm. And we are basically, uh, what we are exploiting is that the setting of our problem gives better parameters, right? And, uh, and what the expander like decomposition really just means is that um, you have a, a, a graph where every pair of vertices is connected by a short path. And if the path length is short, I can use the evan shillock data structure to solve the decremental single source shortest path problem on this structure. But in terms of you know, uh, better understanding of the problem, right? so I think this um, connection to restricted versions of the decremental single search shortest path problem. And then in the recent result, ex exploiting this connection uh, recursively um, is also giving us um, some new tools for getting faster algorithms 
uh, for uh, problems where you rely on expander-like decomposition. Okay? And uh, of course, our tools are still using special properties of well-structured instances and so on. But the recursion is uh, uh, very, um, I think, it's a, it's a nice new idea of uh, building better algorithms iteratively by com controlling the complexity of the problems you're solving. Okay? So those are, I think, some of the takeaways. And, uh, and we are also getting better understanding of some of these decremental problems. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. I guess uh, uh, we will continue. Everyone who wants can ask more questions in the Great House. That will be more less formal. And for those who do not know, you have a chance to learn more cool things from Professor Sanjeev Khanna by attending the class on Thursday. So we have a pleasure of five more weeks. And thanks again for the talk. Thank you.